Okay. Well, excited to talk about network effects today. Thank you all for coming. Um, who here is familiar with uh, social networks? Obviously, everyone's pretty familiar with social networks. Who's familiar with Dun & Bradstreet, the business data set? Everyone's very similar, familiar with that. So um, today you're going to hear about how network effects are enhancing B2B data and how we at Radius are leveraging network effects to build the best business data set. And you know, about three years ago, we had a theory that we could create a network to harness the best B2B contact and best B2B business data um, using network effects in the same way that Facebook did, um, in the same way that social networks do. And uh, I was early at Facebook, and sort of the things that I learned there really drove me to be excited about what it was to have a real network and have a network effect drive value around data. Um, and so, one of the things is that network effects are the foundation for a lot of companies, a lot of really great consumer companies. It's very rare in the B2B space that you see network effects powering companies that are in the enterprise. Um, in fact, I can't really think of that many that are in the enterprise that do have network effects behind them. In the case of the consumer space, we have Facebook. In the case of it, we have you know, Airbnb, eBay, WhatsApp. And what I mean by network effects are that for every new user that the, custom, that the company adds, the network gets better for everybody. That overall, the product gets better for every new user that's on the platform. A good example of this is that when my grandpa joined Facebook, suddenly my photos were all of our family and my news feed got a lot better. Um, in some cases, when I was in college, I had you know, people that were classmates that joined and suddenly my news feed got a lot better. And I was incentivized to invite my friends because I knew the service would get better for every new friend I added. A recent success story in network effects is obviously Snapchat, which has seen incredible growth in the United States, mainly around the quality of these network effects. And what's really interesting is that all of these networks share these characteristics in common. One is that they have a better product that gets better for every new piece of data that enters the system, is that the more data that you have in the system, the more likely you are to drive higher quality information to the network. Um, and in Facebook's case, they're able to harness a lot of information about people. They are able to harness more and more information about people as they add more people to that network. So my co-founders and I sort of sat around and said, well, what could we do to actually build that same characteristic in the B2B space? How could we make it such that network effects were going to drive the same amount of value to a B2B ecosystem in the way that it did in a B2C ecosystem? A very similar example of this is LinkedIn, which is probably one of the few in the enterprise space that actually does have network effects driving the quality of B2B data. And we can see that network effects actually drive immense value. Microsoft was willing to pay $26 billion for LinkedIn. Facebook just passed $400 billion in market cap. So network effects are strong, and they grow exponentially. And so we said, is there a way that we can do this in the business world? Is there a way that we can make it such that we harness enterprise applications and enterprise data to create the best B2B data set, the best B2B information that improves for every new customer that we bring onto the platform? And that sounds a little weird. But what we realized was that everyone now puts their data in the cloud. They all put them in specific tenants. They put them in Salesforce. They put them in CRM. Is there a way that we could actually get the permission of customers to contribute their CRM data that's in the cloud to one central data set, to one central business to business data set? Can we get customers like an insurance company or like a bank to say, I'm willing to validate the phone numbers of a consortium, similar to a credit bureau? And I, am I able to drive these network effects to have the best possible business data set out there? And we realized that it was actually very possible that we could actually connect everyone's CRM together to create this unified consortium B2B data set. And what we realized was that as we added more and more customers, they were willing to share more because our data set got better. We started about three and a half years ago connecting SMBs and connecting small businesses, connecting mid-market businesses that were willing to say, I'm willing to give you, Radius, my CRM data. And in return, I get the best I get the best data back. I'm going to get great data that I don't have back about business information. New leads, new prospects, better prioritized prospects, all those kinds of things. Can I harness that consortium in the right way? And over time, we realized that all of these companies were willing to share 
every attribute about those businesses. They were willing to share attributes like, I'm willing to share how much businesses spend with me, as long as it's anonymized and aggregated into the consortium. And so we started to build a credit bureau-like system for B2B data, for contacts and businesses. And we now track 20 million companies and 30 million contacts that are refreshed every 15 minutes. We have large enterprises, big companies that have opted into participating in this consortium, which ultimately makes the network effect better and better and better. The nice thing about this is that we now have 700 million business records that get contributed to Radius every 15 minutes. And those get crunched down into 18 million businesses total. When we do that calculation, we have significant overlap, which means we have better accuracy, we have better information on companies, and we allow people to go and sell and market in a whole new way than the kludgy solution they were using before with Dun & Bradstreet and having a lot of service products around Dun & Bradstreet to make it successful. Now, what we're seeing is that our current coverage is actually growing significantly. And for every new business, every new company that connects to our network, it enhances the entire network. It means that we have the best B2B businesses and more and more attributes about those businesses over time. It gets us information like which businesses are growing, which ones are shrinking, which contacts are moving from one company to another. And because people keep their CRM data so updated and they have sales reps constantly calling on the phones, those automatically sync to our system and benefit everyone that's connected to our B2B data set. So the data of trifecta is really what we think about. It's what I spend most of my time thinking about with regards to this business, is how do we grow the network? How do we get a bigger network? And how do we make sure that that network is as strong as possible? If we think about LinkedIn, it had 400 million users and only tracked about 5 million companies, or tracks about 5 million companies. And that's worldwide. And every new LinkedIn member that comes on board enhances the quality of that contact data. But we now have a billion signals that are coming into, this, into the system that actually enhance the quality and accuracy and breadth of every business in the country and every contact in the country. We actually know when people have moved from one company to another faster than LinkedIn now because of the number of CRMs that are connected to our business. And that gives us an insane advantage and all the customers that we have an incredible advantage in their marketing and sales efforts. And so what we're starting to see is that because of the network, we're seeing enhanced quality in just phone numbers. Across all the attributes that are tied to a business or a contact, we're seeing an exponential increase in the quality of the phone numbers that we provide our customers, because we're able to get validation points from people that are connected to us. We're also seeing stronger comprehensiveness. We're seeing that people are actually able to connect to the network. And without the network, they're seeing 64% of the companies that they normally would. Now they're able to get up to significantly more companies for every new customer that we add. And on top of this, we're seeing even fresher data. Because our system resyncs with all of our, our customers' as CRMs every 15 to 30 minutes, we're able to refresh the quality of the data that everybody leverages ongoing and constantly. And we're refreshing their CRM in the background, making it such that they have higher quality data inside their CRM and marketing systems, knowing that they're going to call the right people at the right time to close that deal. Overall, this process is now operating an insane scale. It's about 1.3 petabytes of data streaming through the system every day. And that's text data. That gives you a sense as to the level of scale that this operates at in order to ensure that the data quality around business information is as strong as possible. So when you have these, the data trifecta, you actually have deeper insights. You have better predictions and higher ROI. One of the things that a lot of enterprise software companies are talking about today is AI, artificial intelligence. I, Salesforce talks about Einstein. IBM talks about Watson. But all of these systems require high quality data to make great decisions and predictions. It's one of the reasons why we started with the data problem, was that everyone who's doing lead scoring or predictive analytics or artificial intelligence, they're assuming that these algorithms can learn better and faster with bad data. And the truth of the matter is, is you can make great predictions with really weak algorithms and very strong and high quality data. And so we said, if we can increase the ROI of our customers by actually having the ability for them to have great data and then enhance their predictions, we can really change how people sell and market in the B2B space. Now, in the B2B space, there aren't that many solutions. There aren't many choices. If you're a B2B marketer, your choices are phone and email and spamming as much as you possibly can. Even Salesforce still probably emails a lot of customers. Even companies that are at scale are still using these older, tired channels. So we said, is there a way that we can actually 
use a network to allow people to connect to their customers using ads, direct targeting for B2B. LinkedIn tried to do this, but they didn't have enough references to the right cookies. They didn't have enough network data to actually connect customers to B2B business or to businesses in an efficient way. So our network really is offering not just deeper insights and better prediction, but we're also allowing customers to go multi-channel. Think about ways in which they can reach customers, businesses, and contacts across ad channels and other channels that are out there. And this entire theory, which we thought of as sort of as a project to begin with, was can we build this network? Can we make it such that our network has higher quality, better accuracy, and better breadth than someone like D&B, which is really your only choice if you are a B2B marketer or seller? And the end of the day, we actually proved that we can build a better quality database with more capabilities and that customers are willing to contribute their data to a consortium. And we thought that that was crazy. We thought that would only happen in the mid-market, but it's happening in the enterprise. And as we add more and more customers, our network gets better, and we have more and better data to provide to all of the customers that we have in our, in our consortium. And this just gives you a sense as to the level of advertising reach with our network data. So before, you used to only be able to target a certain amount of businesses on Facebook. If you were targeting B2B business, if you were targeting B2B on Facebook, you could only go after business owners in the SMB across a limited number of companies. In the mid-market, even less, and in enterprise, it was very difficult because most people don't put their work email in Facebook. We actually created a channel where you can go to Facebook, Twitter, and Google and get 15 times the match rate, 19 times the match rate you would with DNB. So you can directly target a contact, directly target a, a business with your message. Good example of this is let's say that I'm NetSuite and I want to target every single VP of finance that's, under, that's over 500 employees, telling them you really need ERP. That's not possible anywhere today unless you're using Radius because no one has the references to those cookies. No one has the references to those audiences. So how did we get this data? Well, it's that every single CRM that's contributing to our platform is telling us work email, personal email, personal presence, all of these things that are being contributed to our platform that all of our customers can benefit from. So this is something that we really focus on a lot, is building that deep relationship between technology providers and customers, is that all of our customers trust us. Our number one value is customer trust. We never give one customer's data to another customer. But there is a way, and we've proven that with the customers connected to Radius, that we can create a consortium of B2B data by connecting everyone's CRM together so that we can all benefit to improve marketing ROI, improve, improve sales ROI, and drive across many, many different channels. And that's it. Thank you so much. I'd love to take any questions if you guys have any. Yes? We don't. We don't. And actually, our business model is uh, very much a SaaS subscription fee. And we actually give you unlimited data with that. So as long as you're connected and you're contributing and, and you can push and pull an unlimited amount. There are rate limits to that, so you're not spamming the network. But uh, we, we don't have that same issue that a lot of the, uh, the data vendors where they sell on a per lead basis. We don't do that. We just sell the software. <laughs> yeah, so the price point is uh, definitely anywhere from high seven figures all the way down to smaller companies. They only use it for in pay six figures. So it's really an annual license fee, depending on the amount of data that you have in your system and the amount that you consume, what type of channels you want to use, what type of you know, features you want to use as well. Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. The first one is, um, is definitely we think about that constantly. We want as much as we can possibly get. And then we have our data science team sort of triage what's important and interesting, what can actually be a good validation point. Um, it turns out that certain objects within people's CRMs and marketing automation are more valuable than others. So like a sales activity data point, I, I'm a rep at this company and I called another company and they picked up. That's a very, very valid first party data signal, much more valuable than like just a lead that's in their CRM. 
Um, so it really is a triage basis. The second question um, was basically around the, the uh, give get model. How do we convince people? Um, it, it turns out that the market is so broken and that people are so fed up with DNB and people are so fed up with Axiom and these other data sources that they have less reluctance to being part of something that will drive marketing ROI. And there are some companies that are very reluctant to it, but once you get that one enterprise in a vertical, it's sort of dominoes after that, and everyone agrees to consent to this process. It's a very, very, um, it's a very, very uphill battle. It's one of the reasons why we didn't, you know, our first enterprise customer wasn't willing to do this until about a year ago, and now they, every enterprise is willing to do it. Before that, it was just the mid market and small companies. So what we did was we said, here's how good the network is, and here's how much cheaper it would be for you, and all the features you would have access to if you contributed. And then everyone sort of went into line. But there was a period of time where everyone's like, "No way will you do this." I mean, everyone thought we were crazy. Uh, but in the same way, everyone thought, you know, Facebook was crazy when they said they'd be two billion users, and they're almost there. So it's like a very, uh, it's a very similar thing around network effects: is that they're hard to believe, but once they start to take off, you can't really control them. It's just so nice. Yeah. Yes. No, we don't. We don't. Uh, so this is only on the B2B side. So um, we, but we have no, we haven't. Um, we definitely store some conversion data if people buy Facebook ads through this platform, but we, we don't store Facebook data from apps. No, we do have mobile IDFAs though, so you can target a specific business contact on their mobile device. Um, so some of the connected C marketing automation uh, systems are uh, they acquire they have an inbound lead that comes into that marketing automation and it may have come from a mobile device that streams into Marketo and then we sync to those systems and use that to enhance the uh, identifiers. So what we do there is we take all the customer contributed data and we cross reference personal email, personal phone, and work email, and work phone. And then we hash those and send them to an onboarder. But in some cases, we also have a cookie. Live ramp, ODC, we integrate with all those, yeah. Mm -hmm. But because of the personal reference, cross-reference with the work reference, our match rates are, are significantly higher across all of these, uh, these platforms. It's a good question. So I don't spend my time thinking too much about other anything else besides growing the network. Like that's really all I care about right now. And the reason for that is that if the network is at scale, we'll know all those opportunities. We have had a lot of interest from people saying build a credit score, build a trade network. Uh, you know, supply chain management has been a, uh, an inquiry as well. There are a lot of things. I mean, if we know what people's spend habits and you know credit or debtor debtor habits are as well, um, we can we can make a good determination there. But ultimately. Our focus is 100% on the network because once we get to about 5 billion contributions a day, this is sort of what we believe mathematically, no one will be able to touch us and we'll be the best de facto B2B data set. So once you're at that point, then you can start to layer on additional applications on top of the platform. So when we think about product right now, we think about new integrations that drive better network effects. So. Um, in terms of in our data set or customer base? Oh, so we, we cover every business now. Um, we do every business in the United States. We're only in the US. We probably will expand, expand globally in the next you know, three to five years because the market's so big in the US. Um, in terms of our, our customers, really heavy in financial services, insurance, um, some in media, some in advertising. You've got a few in technology, but uh, a lot in retail. But anyone who really cares about B2B with a high LTV B2B is going to be very interesting to us and, and, and comes and approaches us about working with us. Yes? I noted on your chart where you talked about distance under 50 employees. That doesn't seem to be your focus. It, we, we do. Actually, we started in collecting data on the SMB, on under 50 employee SMBs. Um, and um, that, is, that is really where we excelled for a long time. Now we're pretty broad across any business, um, but we do very well in the SMB, which is something that a lot of the other vendors don't do well. Um, the results just aren't as good as what I said the chart was recommending. Uh, no, no, no. The results in terms of match rate are not as high because the population is so much bigger. 
So the larger the, the there's a huge SMB population, so you're going to be less likely to get a hit in terms of the match rates to those ad platforms. Also, there are a lot of small business owners that don't really use these systems. They don't use Facebook or they don't use Twitter enough to have a cookie. So that is a constraint. I expect that will improve over time as more and more business owners, you know, adopt mobile, adopt, you know, having a Facebook page, etc. So, yeah. Any others? Yes. Percentage of spend, we don't, because that affects our business model. We're, we're very, very focused on having a high gross margin SaaS business, so we we don't take a percentage of that. We've thought about it. A lot of people have said, "Do you want you know to have that as part of your business? You know, it is extra revenue, but it really affects the gross margin." What I like doing is actually coming up with a calculation for a SaaS fee that is a, a slight conversion from CPM or CPC to that that uh, SaaS business model that's higher gross margin. So it's also more predictable. Okay, well thank you so much everybody.